In this video, we're going to take a look at SQL Fire, which is a horizontally scalable, memory-oriented SQL database. VMware released its beta of SQL Fire on June 7th, and in this video, I'm going to go through part of the quick start guide just to give a sense of what SQL Fire is and what it can do. First thing you're going to want to do is visit vmware.com slash go slash SQL Fire, which will show you a page that looks pretty similar to this. Click on the big green button, you'll be taken to a site where you can download the SQL Fire beta. I'm not going to go through that in this video. Instead, I'm going to just focus on the quick start guide since I've already downloaded the beta bits. Instead, if we click on the big red button, we'll be taken to the quick start guide, which starts out by telling us how to install SQL Fire. Now, SQL Fire is written in Java, and the installer is actually a jar file, so you're going to need to have Java installed on your system before you get started. But once you do, download the SQL Fire beta jar and place it somewhere that's convenient to you and run java-jar with the name of the installer. When you do that, you're going to be sort of presented with a uh, EULA text that's uh, kind of hard to read, but nobody ever reads these things anyway. So let's just scroll to the bottom and we type agree to get going. And then we can just sort of uh, select the default location, doesn't really matter, and we'll finish up with the installation. The tutorial covers five steps, as you can see here. I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just going to hit a couple of the highlights. This is just to give you a, a bit of a flavor of SQL Fire. So encourage you to download it and try it yourself. But I'm going to go through a few of the steps. Starting out with, we're going to create a system with two members in it. So to start out, we'll make two directories to hold the data for these two separate members. And then if we scroll down, we see that uh, it's telling us to set some path information. Ultimately, we want to be able to run this SQLF command, which I don't have in my path right now. So what I'll do here is I will, you know, take a look at where it is. I'm going to export that into my path. And the goal ultimately is to be able to run that SQLF from the command line directly without any problems. There we go. So we got it in the path now, and let's move on. So this command here, let's, uh, let's move that over into the terminal and kick it off. What this is going to do is create two members of this SQL Fire system. If we dissect the command a little bit, they're running in those two directories we created a little while ago. One is running on port 1527, and run, one is running on port 1528, if I want to connect to it. Uh, they also run on the same multicast port, so they're able to discover each other, talk to each other, and so on. One important thing that we'll see in the terminal is an indication that uh, the distributed system has two members, which means that these two processes were able to find each other and they've, they've talked to each other, they've understood each other, and they're running basically as one system. So next, let's connect in and take a look at what's going on. I'll launch the SQLF command, and based on the quick start, it tells me how to connect. So there's connect client, and I say localhost and the, the port number. One thing worth noting here is there's no database name. If you're running SQL Fire, uh, everything runs in one database, sort of a, a default or global database, if you will. So we don't give it a name. Next, I can go in here and start looking at my tables. So I can just show all the tables that are in there. Uh, another pretty cool thing I can do is take a look at all the members that are in this distributed system. So if I run this command, SQL Fire will tell me all of the different nodes in the system. And you can see here that I have two nodes based on 
launching two nodes that were able to locate each other and connect up to each other. Okay, let's break out of that and continue on with a quick start. One of the other directories that was installed when I installed SQL Fire was this quick start directory. If we go in here, we can see there's a bunch of .sql files that do various things like create tables or insert data and so on. So let's, from within here, let's launch SQLF again. And I'll just uh, control R and connect in again. Um, pretty helpful. And then just based on following along with the quick start here, I'm going to run a couple of these SQL commands. As you can see here, it's just going to put some data, put some tables, and so on into the database. Now, after I do that, if I run show tables again, uh, you'll see that there's some new tables here that are marked as app or application tables. So we've got cities and countries and so on. And I can go in here and issue some pretty typical SQL commands, just uh, you know, very typical things like you would expect, and uh, get results like I would expect. I can look at all these cities and so on. Let's run a little bit more advanced of a query now. This one will query some data from the various cities whose uh, native languages end in the letters ESE. So, for example, Japanese or Chinese and etc. Point is really that SQL Fire supports a very rich set of SQL querying. There's quite a lot more in the Quick Start Guide that I'm not going to go through here. This is just a little flavor. Feel free to download the product and give it a try. Go through the Quick Start Guide on your own. Now I'm going to go through a little feature that I think is pretty cool that you're not going to see in the Quick Start Guide. One of the big concerns people have when they're building apps these days is what's going to happen if something crashes. So I want to show you exactly what happens in SQL Fire when one node very suddenly and ungraciously disappears. Remember, I started two nodes in my distributed system. And if I look at the output of netstat, I can actually look at the processes and which process is connected to which. Based on this, I see that I'm connected from process 30708. I'm connected in to process 30502. This is all happening over port 1527. So I'm going to simulate a very hard crash of my server, process ID 30502. And remember, there's two nodes in the system, so I'm just going to kill this thing very suddenly. And so what's going to happen in the client when I do that? Let's take a look. So the client doesn't seem to have noticed any real problem. Let's take another look at the netstat output and figure out what went on. So if we look at this here, we actually see the client transparently reconnected to that other member of the system automatically. And this is actually a property of the client libraries that are used when you talk to SQL Fire. So if you build an application using these libraries, you actually benefit and you get the same behavior. It's a really cool feature. And it's really kind of critical when you're looking at distributed systems, large scale distributed systems, because their failure rates are really magnified and you have to be able to deal with this sort of stuff. So again, go check out SQL Fire, vmware.com slash go slash SQL Fire, and that'll get you to the download. Be sure to visit our forums and let us know what you think.